All right, so um, we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday. Uh, we were talking about the the basic anatomy and physiology of the kidney. So now we're going to go we're going to go into real uh, well not real but we're going to go into a little more detail um, regarding the physiology of the kidney, specifically of the neuron, and that's going to help us understand the processes of uh, filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion in a little better detail. And we're also going to be able to appreciate where some of these hormones and where some medications act upon the kidneys. Okay, so when we look at the kidneys here, let me just choose a little arrow thingy. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so when we look at the kidneys, remember that blood comes into the nephrons from the renal artery and the renal artery branches out into arterioles and eventually you get down to the afferent arterial and blood comes into the nephron through the afferent arterial and then leaves the nephron via the efferent arterial. Are you guys, you guys okay with that? And blood goes into this capillary structure here known as the glomerulus and that is contained within this structure here known as the Bowman's capsule. You guys, you guys cool with that? And then you have special cells, um, podocytes and other cells within the glomerulus that um, kind of make the capillary beds more or less permeable. And what happens is the hydrostatic pressure, basically the, the blood pressure, pushes solutes and fluids through those those openings. They're like little openings in the, in the vessels, little fenestrations. That, and they basically get pushed through into this part of the Bowman's capsule here. Now, very large molecules cannot make it through these fenestrations. So guess what? Blood cells, large proteins... Um, those kinds of things are not able to get through, but smaller molecules are, such as ions, water, urea, amino acids, okay, those kinds of things can get through. Um, so the smaller molecular weight stuff gets pushed through, and the uh, stuff that is larger, the, the, the blood cells and large proteins and things like that, stay within the circulatory system. You guys cool with that? So all the stuff that gets pushed out through the glomerulus into here is known as filtrate. You guys, you guys cool with that? That's called filtrate. And then that filtrate makes its way through a series of tubules of the nephron. Okay. And as that filtrate makes its way through all of these little tubules, most of the water and those filtered out ions and molecules will get reabsorbed. So just like we talked about the refrigerator analogy yesterday, where we kind of when you one way of cleaning up is is you take everything everything out of your refrigerator and then you put back the things that you need and and you don't, the things that you don't need. And that's kind of how the, the kidneys work. And so you have reabsorption of water, of sodium ions, chloride ions, potassium ions, bicarbonate ions, urea, um, and, and, and other molecules um, to include water. And then if you don't need it, you don't reabsorb it. It stays within these tubules and becomes secreted, right? Does that make sense? It's secreted, it stays in here, and it moves along. It doesn't get reabsorbed. And then eventually, that filtrate becomes urine, and then it gets dumped into the collecting duct, okay? And then you have all of these other nephrons also connecting. And eventually, the connecting ducts connect, and you get a minor calyx and a major calyx in the pelvis, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you guys okay there with the, kind of the big picture of, of how that's working? Okay. So just remember, you have filtrate that's produced here in the glomerulus. And then that filtrate 
as you have reabsorption okay, of the necessary water and uh, molecules that you need, that filtrate will become more concentrated and eventually it will become urine. Okay? That's, the, that's the general picture of what's going on in, in the nephron. Okay, so let's just take a look at some of the nuance here. So right here, this tubule that's closest to the Bowman's capsule, okay, and it is very twisty looking. You guys kind of see that, how it has that real twisty, tur curvy appearance. That's known as, th th those are also known as convolutions. And so this is known as the proximal convoluted tubule. Why? Well, it's proximal to the Bowman's capsule, and it's convoluted. It's twisty. All right. You guys, you guys kind of cool with that? Now, here's the interesting thing. The efferent tubule, what happens to the efferent tubule is instead of just going directly to the renal vein, the efferent tubule actually becomes a capillary network that wraps around all of the collecting tubules and the collecting duct of the nephron. And I can't draw that here, so what I've done is I've simplified it as just, see here the, the efferent tubule comes down, and see how I've drawn it more or less parallel with the rest of the nephron? Um, that's the best way I could think of, of, of showing you that this is in fact wrapped around and it, inter it continues to interact with the nephron. And because it goes around the tubules, we call this the peritubular capillary network, or the peritubular capillaries. Um, so are you guys okay with my, my simplification that I made there? I kind of simplified that. Um, so the efferent tubule comes down, and then it wraps around all of these tubules as they make their way toward the collecting duct. And so what happens is, as that filtrate moves through different parts of these tubules, you have different ion pumps and ion channels. Um, for the most part, the ions undergo active transport. There is some passive and facilitated diffusion, but you have a lot of active transport going on and you have what are called ion exchange channels. So what you do is you pump one ion one way, and then the payoff is another ion gets pumped another way. So you can have sodium-potassium exchangers, you can have sodium chloride exchangers, you can have, um, uh, let's see here, sodium chloride exchangers, you can have, uh, uh, hydrogen ion, hydrogen potassium ion exchangers. So you have all these different, these different pumps that are embedded, okay, within the um, the tubules at different different areas, and they're more concentrated in certain areas of the tubules. Okay, so as that filtrate makes its way along the first part here, the proximal tubule, the primarily what you see happening is you have sodium reabsorption. So sodium gets pumped back into the capillaries, right? That's what reabsorption is, is it gets reabsorbed back into the circulatory system. And wherever you have sodium being pumped, what gets pulled along with the sodium? Water. So in a lot of cases, water is going to passively diffuse in response to these ion gradients that are created by the pumps. Does that kind of make sense? So you've got active transport of sodium ions, but because the sodium is now more concentrated over here, the water is going to get pu pulled out of that filtrate, and then it'll get reabsorbed back into the paratubular capillary network. You also have amino acids getting pumped back in um, here as well. And in fact, approximately 65 to 70 percent of the total reabsorption that occurs in your kidneys will occur within the proximal convoluted tubule. So a majority of the work occurs there. And then the, the 30, 35 percent of reabsorption occurs everywhere else in the, the loop of Henle, 
the distal convoluted collecting tubule, and even some in the collecting duct. You guys okay there? And interestingly enough, most of our drugs and hormones, in fact, do not work on the proximal convoluted collecting tubule. Most of our drugs and hormones work on the other 30, 35% of reabsorption. Okay, so it's more in the fine tuning where we have drugs, hormones, and things like that working. Okay, so that filtrate comes through. You have a, a, a majority of your water and sodium reabsorption as well as amino acids gets reabsorbed. And then that filtrate makes its way down into the loop. And the thing that you want to know about the loop is, and we'll zoom in a little bit here, the loop has three components. It has a descending limb, it has the loop, and then it has an ascending limb. And part of the ascending limb gets thicker. That's called a thick ascending and the thin ascending, thick descending and thin descending. We're not going to go into the detail of what's going on between thick and thin. We're just going to keep it rather general. Um, but what we have here is a really interesting mechanism occurring. So, let me show you kind of how it works. So the filtrate moves, transitions from the proximal convoluted collecting tubule down the descending loop. And the descending loop is only permeable to water. It is impermeable to any other ion. You guys okay with that? So you have water reabsorption occurring at the descending loop. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. And then as that filtrate makes its way into the ascending loop, the ascending loop is impermeable to water, but instead it is lined with sodium ion pumps. And so you only have sodium reabsorption occurring in the ascending loop, and you only have water reabsorption occurring in the descending loop. And what this does is this sets up for a really interesting process. So if you have a bunch of sodium getting pulled out here, the overall sodium concentration in the medulla, remember this is occurring in the medulla, and this is all the cortex here, and here's the del delineation here. So the medulla, those pyramids within your kidneys are very salty. They have lots of sodium in them. Why do you suppose we kind of have this mechanism? What's, what, what's going on with this, this mechanism here? You can, can change the amount of water that's being pulled out of the descending loop. Perfect. Based on Perfect. Descending. Yeah, so what happens is the ascending loop concentrates the sodium outside of the tubule, and then that makes more water passively diffuse out of the descending loop. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, the ascending loop pulls the sodium out and concentrates it here. That concentration of sodium then causes more water reabsorption here, right? Does that kind of make sense? It's kind of a, a, a double mechanism going on. So only water absorption occurs here and only sodium reabsorption occurs here, but this sodium gradient, this concentration of sodium that's created here, increases the amount of water reabsorption that occurs over here in the descending loop. Does that, does that kind of make sense there? And this mechanism is known as countercurrent multiplication. Does that make sense? And basically, it's the sodium, this active transport of sodium that multiplies, right, significantly adds to the amount of water reabsorption that you have occurring. You guys, you guys cool with that? And uh, I do want to put a note here. This is where our loop diuretics work, right, on the loop of Henle. 
And the way that the loop diuretics work is they interfere with this sodium transporter. Okay? And so what they do is they prevent the sodium transporter from pumping sodium out into the pyramids. So that reduces sodium reabsorption, which in turn reduces what? Or does it? Or does it do something else? Say that again. It prevents what? No, I, I asked. I asked. I, I was a question. Yeah, but say the first part of the, say the question. Well, the whole thing. Okay, so I, I said, well, if I interfere with the pump, that must mean that I interfere with the reabsorption of sodium. And I, I, I should have been specific. I should have put a question mark there. Pumps. Yes. Yes, you mess with the with the sodium, with the, uh, the amount of sodium. transport into the the vein, the, <laughs> the paratubular capillaries. Going to reduce the amount of water. Okay, is that what we see when we give somebody a loop diuretic, though? No. No. So I was asking a confusing question to try to illuminate what's really going on. So, so do the loop diuretics make the ion channels more? Well. Remember what I told you at the beginning of this lecture about the pumps. If one ion goes one way, another ion has to go another way. So these are not just sodium pumps. These are sodium-potassium transporters. And the way that this works is it exchanges sodium and potassium. So if sodium gets reabsorbed, potassium stays in or gets pulled in to the tubule, right? Mm -hmm. So when I give a diuretic, what it does is it reverses, in essence, it reverses that action and it causes potassium to, come out. to be reabsorbed and sodium to be secreted and ultimately excreted. Which causes water to stay in the loop and water to get secreted and excreted. So water and sodium, or yeah, water and sodium stays in, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. And then you pee it off. Make sense? Yeah. Cool, cool, yeah. All right. Uh, let's now talk over here. So now you have that filtrate make its way from the ascending loop into the last part of the nephron known as the distal convoluted collecting tubule. And yes, it is convoluted, but I kind of had to make it straight um, just for uh, purposes of idealization and making this a little easier to understand. Here's a weird thing, though. The distal tubule swings back around and it touches, it kind of kisses, if you will, kisses the Bowman's capsule. So you see how this comes back around near the Bowman's capsule and then goes away? Okay. And this area where it kisses is known as the juxtaglomerular apparatus or apparatus. And within this little area here you have some interesting structures. You have cells called granular cells that line the afferent arterial. So you see where the afferent arterial is right here? You have these granular cells line the afferent arterial where the distal convoluted tubule comes by. And these cells here monitor the chemical environment of that filtrate as it goes by. Okay? And they monitor pressure as well. And if they detect that there's a problem, okay, i.e. that the pressure's not good, um, then they secrete the renin. And then that renin gets dumped into the afferent 
arterial which gets circulated through the capillary network out to the vein, into the blood, and that's the whole renin angiotensin aldosterone cascade we talked about, right? Okay, but that occurs, that renin is secreted from these granular cells, okay, and they're located right around the afferent arterial as it comes into this, what we call the juxtaglomerular apparatus here, okay, and so they're monitoring the environment here, the chemical um, environment and the, the, the pressures and when they detect, hey, I, I don't think we're getting good perfusion, I don't think enough fluid's coming through, we're having to reabsorb a lot of the extra stuff, um, I'm going to go ahead and start releasing my renin and letting the body know, okay, we need to start getting more fluid and conserving water and all that. Does, does that kind of make sense? They don't have a special name, just renin secreting granular cells? Uh, granular cells, yeah. They're called the granular, granular cells, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you also have another structure in there called the macula densa, okay? And the, the macula densa um, also um, monitors the internal environment. In the macula densa, there are cells that release substances that can cause vasoconstriction and vasodilation. And that's kind of like a fine-tuning thing. So if you if, if 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 that filtrate at this point, you still need to reabsorb more stuff. It can make the capillaries and the um, tubules more or less permeable to certain ions to to increase reabsorption or to to kind of back off on reabsorption. There does that kind of make sense? So you've got some real fine-tuning that starts occurring here in the distal convoluted tubule. You also have additional sodium and water reabsorption occurring here. And in fact, this is where our thiazide diuretics work, like hydrochlorothiazide. You know, so uh, your ferrosamide would, would work here. Your thiazide works at pumps, sodium pumps, within the distal convoluted collecting tubule. And then finally, that filtrate become, should become more concentrated. It dumps into the collecting tubule, okay? And the collecting tubule itself has pumps. And believe it or not, you can also have a little bit of water and sodium <laughs> reabsorption occurring within the collecting tubule itself. And this is where the hormone aldosterone works is it works upon pumps within the collecting tubule. And remember we talked about vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone? Vasopressin's action is on the distal convoluted collecting tubule. And it acts to cause reabsorption, additional reabsorption of sodium in water, right? Specifically water. And so when you have low amounts of vasopressin, what happens? More water stays in and more water gets urinated out. If you have too much vasopressin or, or increased levels of vasopressin, you have what? Increased reabsorption of water and decreased secretion and excretion of water. Does that, does that kind of make sense in a nutshell there? Does that? Yeah? Sort of? Sort of? Yeah. It's a lot going on. It's a lot going on, huh? It's very, very nuanced. Yeah. It's a lot in a little, little, yeah. So, again, at the end of the day, what happens is filtration occurs here, right? And you create filtrate. And then as that filtrate moves its way through the proximal convoluted collecting tubule, the loop of Henle, and the distal convoluted collecting tubule, you have reabsorption of the stuff that got filtered. And you reabsorb what you need to, and then you secrete and excrete what you don't. And so the unneeded water, electrolytes, molecules, or what have you, ultimately gets excreted in the urine. Does that make sense? the filtrate is turned into urine. Sort of? Is that the big picture kind of makes sense there a little bit? Okay.
cool. That's the, that's all the detail that we need to go into to really understand what's going on for, for our purposes. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to talk about some of the major problems with nephrology. One of the big problems that we run into is something called acute renal failure, or ARF. And this is a failure of the kidneys to function. And because we call it acute renal failure, it occurs rather quickly. Generally, it occurs over hours to days. Its onset and presentation is very quick. There are three major causes of acute renal failure. There is a, what we call pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. And the cause has to do with where in or outside of the kidney we're talking about. The pre-renal causes are before you even get into the kidney itself. So where is this primarily going to be? The rest of the body. Huh? The rest of the body. Uh, possibly the rest of the body, yeah. And if you had to guess what would probably be the most common cause of your kidneys failing before you even get to them? Your heart. Maybe your heart. There you go. Yes, hypovolemia is one of the major causes. And in fact, pre-renal causes are the most common cause of acute renal failure. Okay, so if you get hypovolemic, for example, or any shock state whatsoever, if you go into a prolonged shock state, you are not perfusing your kidneys, right? So blood isn't even getting to the kidneys. So that's what we mean by pre-renal, is you're not even getting stuff to the kidneys. Does that, does that kind of make sense there? <laughs> so shock states, not just hypovolemia, but sepsis and septic shock, cardiogenic shock, okay, anytime you have a prolonged shock state, right, you can, you can take your kidneys out. Another relatively common pre-renal cause of acute renal failure is something called rhabdomyolysis. And we talked about this, but what is rhabdomyolysis? So cells Good. So it's destruction of muscle tissue. Myoglobin gets released in your blood. Myoglobin is a relatively large protein. Myoglobin is very good at clogging up your little arterioles, right? And so they're very good at preventing perfusion of your, your glomeruli, right? That's the primary reason you see acute renal failure in, like, hikers. And yeah, people that are in rhabdo. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, well, if you get dehydrated, it could be hypovolemia. So a combination of the both. Yeah, simply due, just due to no perfusion of your kidneys. Uh, um, this, is, this is actually the primary thing we send people to the hospital. Yep, we see it all the time. Maybe yep. Maybe. If you go uh, heat stroke, right? Rhabdomyolysis lysis is very common with heat stroke. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, renal artery disease, for example, a renal artery stenosis. Um, and I just put a little question mark here. ACE inhibitors contraindicated if your patient has a history of renal artery stenosis. You don't want to cause that renal artery to spasm any more than necessary. You don't want to mess with it. Uh, car you know, again, shock states. Certain medications, right, that can inhibit um, blood flow into the kidneys. Uh, several different types of antibiotics are very good, are very renal, renal toxic. Hypertension, if it interferes with the flow of blood into the kidneys as well. And then just trauma and massive burns because they tend to cause hypovolemia. So you can have a kidney injury that goes on to kidney failure just by becoming hypovolemic, just going into hypovolemic shock or whatever kind of shock. Okay, the next cause is intrarenal, or what we call intrinsic, and this is within the kidneys themselves, within the nephrons themselves. Um, acute tubular necrosis. And basically what happens is acute tubular necrosis is generally the result of a pre-renal cause, right? So you have pre-renal injury, 
and then you develop acute tubular necrosis, which is actually within the nephron, but ultimately, oftentimes, it is due to some prerenal issue. And then glomerular disease. Problems with the glomeruli are very common intrarenal causes of renal failure. Infections, for example, good pasture syndrome, um, infective endocarditis, strep, for example, is very good. Um, lots of people who have untreated strep will go on to develop um, renal failure due to the bacteria colonizing the kidneys and causing something known as glomerular nephritis. Have you guys ever heard of that? It's an infection of the nephron and, well, the glomerulus, but yeah. Does that, does that make sense? Um, chronic illnesses like polycystic kidney disease, which is a relatively common um, problem. Um, where people end up developing cysts within their kidneys. And then those cysts, of course, you know, cause damage and destruction of the nephrons. Um, lupus as well, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, um, granulomatosis, where you have um, abnormal granulation tissue forming. Um, anytime you have autoimmune diseases, you're going to be at a higher risk for intrarenal failure. You guys, you guys okay with that? And then finally, we have what are called post, what is called post renal failure. And this is also known as obstructive. And so you obstruct the flow of filtrate and urine out of the kidney. And this tends to produce a condition known as hydronephrosis. Have you guys ever heard that term? Hydronephrosis. It literally means water on the kidney. And basically, what happens is the kidneys will begin to enlarge. Right, as the, there's a backup of, of urine and they, they fill up, they enlarge. And what do you suppose are common causes of post renal failure? Prostate cancer. Huh? Prostate cancer. Uh, yep, okay, so if you have a large prostate, kidney stones, kidney stones is, a, is a cause, definitely, right? Kidney stones can cause obstruction, um, outlet, outlet obstruction of the kidneys, tumors as well, tumors can cause that. Um, and then, like you guys said, problems with your urethra because you can't get urine out of the bladder. Um, you can have obstructions, strictures, prostate issues as well. Okay, you guys, you guys cool with that? That, that kind of makes sense. Hey, Chris. Yeah. On the intrarenal? Uh huh. And do it to pre renal issues? Is there any specific ones or just in general? All of them. Well, all of them. Yeah, and basically what I was saying there is a lot of the prerenal problems can cause acute tubular necrosis. So it may not be as, as, as clear cut as, oh, it's strictly intrarenal, right? You, you, you get some major crossover, of course, but we try to separate a little bit just to make it easier to, to learn. You guys okay with that there? Is that why a lot of your like ARFs, if you have a major prerenal issue, if it goes into an intrarenal issue, you're going to have like chronic renal failure? You could. Yeah, you very well could. Yeah. It's a tricky thing. Uh, sometimes people recover real well. Right? People can recover, right, even from acute tubular necrosis, um, some people can go on to recover um, really well, and, and some people not so much. Um, so what do we use to kind of determine where somebody's at? In their kidney disease. Well, we use something known as the glomerular filtration rate. Okay, this is not something you can calculate in the back of the ambulance, though. You need labs, and you need to know how big your patient is. And basically, what we do is we look primarily at how big they are, and we figure out how much body surface area they have, how many square meters of body surface area do they have. All right. And then based um, on their renal function tests, their BUN and creatinine, remember we talked about those early in our lab class, those are primary um, kidney labs, right? They get very elevated when our kidneys aren't working or when we're not getting perfusion to the kidneys, such as a pre-renal cause. Um, specifically, the creatinine is really important. And we take that stuff together, put it into a formula, and then a number pops out of that formula. You don't have to memorize all that. Um, you just have to know the, what, the, what that is. It is the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate, and it is measured in milliliters per minute per square meter of body surface area. 
So basically, it's, it's, it's a way of looking at how much perfusion do you have going into your glomeruli um, in, in reference to body overall body surface area. Okay, so it's milliliters per minute per square meter of body surface area. And um, 60 to 120 is considered normal. Okay, so 60 to 120 is considered normal. As you age, it goes down, um, and you tend to lose at least, uh, on the average, of about one um, per year after the age of 35. So the, by the time you're pushing 70 to 80, um, it is not uncommon to have a GFR around 60. And so that's why there is such a wide range that's considered normal. Now, if you had a 21-year-old with a GFR of 60, that's going to probably be much more concerning than, say, an 83-year-old with a GFR of 60. Does that, does that make sense? So there's nuance to this range, of course. All right. Kidney disease is considered uh, 15 to 60, and there are different levels of kidney disease. There's, there's uh, level 1, 2, I think like 2A, 2B, 2A, 3. Uh, well, you don't have to remember all the different levels. Um, but 15 to 60 is considered kidney disease. The lower you get, the more diseased you are. And then anything less than 15 is considered complete failure of the kidneys. Does that, that make sense? Complete failure, this generally means dialysis. Okay, you guys, you guys okay with that? Um, and so the way that we can get into renal failure, you can have two things happen. You can develop acute renal failure, Okay, sometimes they'll recover, and you'll have either normal or chronic impairment, or what we call chronic renal insufficiency, okay? Um, and that's where you have disease, okay? You're not necessarily on dialysis, but your kidneys are impaired, and that's what we call chronic renal insufficiency, okay? And then that can then become worse over time and go into chronic renal failure. Likewise, you can also have just a slow, chronic, progressive decrease in your renal function, okay, that isn't necessarily acute. And that will also lead to chronic renal insufficiency and potentially into chronic renal failure in something known as ESRD, or end-stage renal disease. So there are basically two ways. There's the slow, progressive way, or there is the rapid, you go into acute renal failure and you never truly recover, and you go on to failure. Or you develop acute renal failure, you have some recovery, but then you have a progressive decline from there. Does that, that kind of make sense? So there are all sorts of different ways that you can get into that end stage um, renal disease. You can get there rather quickly uh, with acute renal failure that doesn't recover. Um, you can get there just chronically, or you can get there chronically via an acute renal failure that never fully resolves. You guys, you guys okay with that? Okay. But you can fully recover from an acute renal failure. Some people can go on to fully recover without having, without having renal insuffic insufficiency. Yeah, some people can. Some people can't. <laughs> um, about a year and a half ago, my mother had a hypertensive um, emergency, and uh, she went into acute renal failure, and she has not recovered very well from that. Her GFR is about 20 right now. Um, huh? Yeah, so she's she's kind of riding that line. She's just right on that line where you know she's a an illness away from dialysis, basically. Yeah. Um, okay, so when we look at somebody, we assess them. What what kinds of things would point toward the diagnosis or field impression of acute renal failure? or chronic renal failure that has moved into this end-stage renal disease? Well, history, right? If they have a history of these kinds of things, right, history of the major causes of renal failure, combined with clinical findings, 
Okay. Three major clinical findings are known as proteinuria. That's protein in your urine. Remember when I said, um, do, does protein normally get filtered? No. no. Protein only gets into your filtrate when something has gone awry, right? The glomerulus has ceased to function normally and protein can kind of get through. Or the blood pressure is so high in the glomeruli that proteins are forced through. They're, they're, they're kind of, the glomeruli get fractured and protein can get forced through. Either, either way is kind of bad. Would you guys more or less agree? Yeah, either way is kind of a bad bum deal. Um, so you'll pee off protein, and, but the protein levels in your blood will get low. You'll get um, hypoproteinemia, okay? And because you lose protein in your blood, remember protein is what's important for producing <coughs> osmotic pressure and holding fluid within our vessels. So you start losing that protein and then fluid starts leaving, leaving your blood vessels and then you develop swelling, or what we call third spacing, where fluid moves into the interstitial space. And when we see this in patients, these three things happening, proteinuria, hypoproteinemia, and third spacing, this is known as nephrotic syndrome. Okay, nephrotic syndrome. Um, blood pressure changes are common in people with renal failure. Can be very high or very low, right? Depending on what's going on here. Okay, chronically, with chronic renal failure, they tend to be high. Chronic re renal failure patients tend to be more hypertensive. They tend to have problems controlling your blood pressure. Um, your urinary output initially will decrease. It will get very low. Remember what's normal urinary output? It's an adult 0 0.5 to 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour, or 30 to 50 milliliters per hour at a minimum. Okay? Initially, it will get it'll get very low, but sometimes it will increase significantly. And why might that increase? Why might your urinary output increase, even though you're... There you go. You cannot concentrate. So what happens is the urine that comes out is very dilute because you're not reabsorbing. You've got a lot of water in there, right? You can't reabsorb that water. So it gets very dilute. And we measure how concentrated or diluted your urine is with a, something known as specific gravity. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes um, when we talk about looking at a urinalysis. Okay. Dyspnea and wet lung sounds, particularly if you're holding on to fluid. You're not getting rid of fluid. Um, anemia, why? decrease in erythropoietin, right? Because remember, the kidney is a major producer, producer of that hormone. Um, so people in renal failure, particularly chronic renal failure, tend to suffer from chronic anemia. And we tend to often give them injections of erythropoietin because of that. Blood in the urine, or what we call hematuria as well. Um, uremia. Uremia literally means urine in the blood, but uremia results from increased urea, which is also what? <laughs> Ammonia, right? Remember, the, we talked about the urea cycle. Um, urea is, or ammonia is turned into urea by the liver, and then the urea is eliminated, secreted, filtered, secreted, and excreted by the, the kidneys. So if you, you're not able to get rid of the urea, you're going to have an elevated elevation your urea, which will lead to an elevation in ammonia, okay? Um, and in fact, patients can develop what's known as a uremic frost. Have you ever heard of that? Where they actually start excreting through their skin, and they get that a frosty appearance. Like, you guys have sweated a lot. Have you ever sweated a lot? And then after it dries up, it's kind of salty, right, on your shirt or whatever. Um, um, you will see that on your patient's skin, and that is that's that's a classic finding for uremia. They're very itchy, and they get that frost, that, and they may even kind of have a pneumonia-like smell to them. That's yep, uremia. 
The electrolyte abnormalities are very common. What is What are we most concerned about at our level? Hyperkalemia, because we can't eliminate potassium. Um, and then neurological changes may occur as well. So how do we treat somebody if we are seeing all the signs and symptoms of renal failure? OK, I get them to the hospital. Supportive care, right? Um, might we need to give them fluid? Okay, yes. You need to kind of do some investigating. What's my cause, right? If it's a pre-renal cause, they're really hypovolemic, you may need to give them fluids, blood products, right? But if they're very hyper, really hypertensive or they've overdosed on some renal toxic drug, you may want to hold off on fluids, particularly if they look like they have dyspnea and wet lung sounds, right? You may want to hold off on fluids. So you have to make a judgment call based on how they look, all right? So you want to be cautious? You want to be cautious about giving them medications. Why? Because they can't excrete it. They can't. Because oftentimes they will be unable to eliminate medications, all right? And then you'll want to check for shunts and fistulas. And does anyone know what the difference between a shunt and a fistula is? Outside source that they splice to a vein and artery together. What's that? The shunt. Yeah, so a shunt is an implanted device of some sort. So here you have your artery and your vein, and then a shunt I've implanted a device that connects the vein and the artery. A fistula is actually taking a vein and artery and grafting them to each other. Does that make sense? So you open the vein up, you open the artery up, you sew them together, you graft them together. And in both cases, what you're doing is you're producing an, an area where you can stick a big needle into to do your dialysis, right? Does that, that make sense? And so when you're assessing somebody for a shunt or fistula, you'll often notice that you will have venous blood mixing with arterial blood and you get lots of turbulence. And that produces a characteristic kind of feel to it, doesn't it? That produces a brewy, right? And you can actually feel it in a lot of cases. So if somebody has a shunt or fistula, are there any implications for us? Yeah, we want to avoid doing an IV in that arm. Avoid doing a blood pressure in that arm because we don't want to disrupt that, that shunt or that fistula. You guys okay with that? And bleeding is a very common problem with those particularly after following dialysis, right? How do we control it? Just like you would any other bleeding, right? Start with direct pressure, right? Yeah. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Cool, moving right along. All right. Um, so next I want to move into talking about um, uh, urinalysis. This is a very common test. What we do is we take a sample of urine and oftentimes we can do this right in at the bedside with a dipstick. It's called a urine dip. Some of you may have done this as well. Um, and then we can send a sample to the lab for a proper um, urinalysis as well. It's uh, through using validated techniques and equipment. So these are some of the major things we look at. We look for blood, ketones, nitrites, protein, glucose, specific gravity, and bacteria. And generally, the way it's reported is you'll either see a, net, a minus sign, and what does that mean? A minus sign. Oh, I'm sorry, negative. That means negative. You do not detect any of these. And what do you want to see when you run a urinalysis? Negatives, right? What if you see a plus? That means you have the presence of something. And the way that this is often reported is it's either a plus, which means you've got a little bit, we call that plus one, or you might have two pluses, which means you have a moderate amount, that's plus two, or three pluses, which means you have a large amount, or we call plus three. Does that make sense? So if you see plus three blood, that means you have a large amount of blood in the urine. Or plus two bacteria would mean you have a moderate amount of bacteria. Does that... Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so when we look at blood, if you have blood in your urine, you need to be thinking, 
Is there a trauma? Does my patient have hypertension, right, because I can fracture the glomeruli and cause blood cells to leak into the filtrate? Or is there some sort of infection that's compromising, right? Either compromising the glomeruli or oftentimes the infection compromises the urethra and bladder and that's where the blood is coming from. It's not from the kidneys, but it's coming from the irritated bladder and urethral tissue from the, the infection. You guys, you guys okay with that? Kind of, kind of, sort of makes sense? Sure. Okay, cool. Um, nitrite or ketones. Okay, normally we don't see ketones. If you do see ketones, these tend to be the result of infections. Certain bacteria can produce them. Obviously, diabetic ketoacidosis can cause ketones to spill out in your blood. And... In your urine? Huh? In your urine? In your urine, right? Well, this is the urine. Yeah, we're looking right. at the UA. You said blood. So or, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's my bad. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, what will happen is it will cause increased levels in your blood, which then spill out into your urine through your oh, kidneys. Right. Okay. That, yeah. Um, or certain dietary issues, right? You guys are familiar with high-fat diets, right? What we call ketogenic diets, where it's a high-fat, low-carb. Um, and so that may be what people are going after is ketones, right? And so ketones are a very non-specific finding, right? If you just have ketones in your urine, that doesn't really tell you much. All right, so you, you need to put your little de detective hat go on and go, okay, why might there be ketones? It could be something as simple as diet or dehydration, or it could be something as complex as an infection or DKA. You, you just don't know. Um, nitrites. Nitrites are um, typically produced by bacteria. When you have an infection, you, you tend to have more nitrites in your urine. Um, protein. We tend not to have protein in our urine because proteins tend to be too large to get into our urine unless there is some compromise of the glomeruli, right? Like hypertension or trauma. And in some cases, infections, because what are blo what's blood? If you have blood cells in your urine, what do you have a lot of inside of your cells? Say it again? Protein, Protein yeah. So guess what? If you have lots of blood in your urine, you're probably going to have a lot of protein. Does that, does that make sense why? You can have a lot of protein without blood, though. And when you see lots of protein and, and maybe not so much blood, you, you want to be thinking, okay, what's causing that? Is there some hypertension? Is there something going on with the glomerulus at the, at the level of the glomeruli? Glucose. Okay. Normally, we do not lose glucose in our urine until it reaches a until it's generally above 200 or 250. Once we get above about 250, we start having glucose spilling out into our urine. Is, is that the number we should use? I think the book referred 180. Oh, 180? That's okay. The book we'll go with the book, yeah. Okay. G generally, generally, it needs to be above 200 or okay. so, yeah. Um, yeah, so go with the book. Um, but in, in fact, back in the day, before we had fancy technology, <laughs> some people used to taste test urine. Yeah for diagnosing diabetes, yeah, yeah, yeah right, because it would taste kind of sweet. sweet, yeah. Now, I don't know how prevalent um, that was, but, you know, it's something that has did apparently happen, yeah. Yeah, the pee is very sweet. Uh-oh, you've got, you've got the diabetes. And what does, what does, what does diabetes mellitus mean? Oh no! What does it come from, though? Like, like, like what? Oh, like the I, origin I, of the word. Yeah, like, like. Latin. Yeah, it's it's roots. What what does it literally mean? When somebody's diabetic or has diabetes. It means they. Have no, because they didn't know the concept of sugar. Just sweet urine, isn't it? No, it means wasting away. It's a wasting away. Is yeah, it means they waste away. And that's what happened, right, back in the day. People got diabetes. What happened? They started peeing a lot. They're really hungry. They're really thirsty. And they just kind of withered away and ended up dying of, of DKA, dehydration. 
Makes sense. Okay, cool. And bacteria, you shouldn't have bacteria in your urine, right? So that tends to indicate infection. Um, if you are going to get a sample of urine on somebody, how do you get a urine sample? Is, do you just pee and there you go? Yeah, you do clean catch. Yeah. Clean catch. Yeah. You guys familiar with that concept? You pee out a little bit and then catch There you go. So you have to clean up first, right? Because well, you might get bacteria, right? You. If they don't. They ask you to wipe. Wipe with like... Well, with the wipe that they'll give you. With you know, a little wiping, right. like a baby wipe, whatever. Yep. And then you right. peel it all, and then you catch it. And, and how do you wipe? From, the from front to back, right? Yeah. Now, with a male, you do the same thing, except generally you, you grab the penis and you wipe the, the, the meatus. The meatus is just the opening of the um, urethra, so you wipe in a circular motion, and then you begin to urinate a little bit, and then catch midstream. Right, because you can always get some bacteria and skin cells and stuff there in the urethra, and you want to blow that stuff out, and you want to get a true representation of what's in your urine. Um, oftentimes, what'll happen is you'll get like bacteria and stuff in there, and it'll actually be just skin contamination, you know. Um, so you do want to try to get a clean, clean catch if you can. You guys, you guys, cool with that? Um, and then there's this concept known as specific gravity here. And does anyone know what specific gravity is? It's, what is it? It's a relation to water and how much of substance Cool. Weighs. Yeah, so specific gravity is just what you do is you, um, you um, take the ratio of, of density. And does everyone know what density is? Density is mass divided by volume. So whatever your mass is divided by your volume. So you compare the density of one thing to the density of another. In the case of urine-specific gravity, you compare the density of the urine <coughs> to the density of water, right? And so if my, what's your density of water? What, what would we set that at? One, right? That's our standard. We'd say that that's one, right? The density of water is one gram per milliliter or one kilogram per liter, right? Um, and then you take the density of your urine, whatever it is, right? And then whatever the ratio of your urine density to your water density is, is your specific gravity. And so the small, the closer to one you are, the more dilute that urine is, the more water-like that urine is, right? The further away from one it is, the larger that number is, the more dense and concentrated the urine is. Does that make sense? So our normal range is 1.003. Some people will say 1.005, I've heard, um, to 1.03. Okay, so 1.003, which is fairly dilute, to 1.03, which is fairly concentrated. Less than 1.003, so 1.001, for example, would be too dilute, that something's really diluted out. Okay, what's going on? Is it just somebody overhydrated? Are their kidneys failing to concentrate the urine? What's going on? To 1.03, so if, if let's say that their specific gravity is 1.08, that would mean that their urine is really concentrated, right? Are they dehydrated? Is there something going on? Does that does that kind of make sense there? You guys, you guys cool with that? Excellent, excellent. All right. And then finally, I want to mention dialysis, and I won't get to any of the other. I'll get. I'll, well, tomorrow I'll talk about um, renal calculi and um, some of these other urinary uh, urinary tract infections and things like that. We'll talk about those tomorrow. Um, but I just want to mention dialysis. You have two major types of dialysis. You have hemo and peritoneal. And we talked about peritoneal a little bit in um, gastrointestinal, right? Mm -hmm. We said that you can actually use the peritoneum as a membrane, right? And what you do is you have a port in the abdomen, and generally this occurs at night because it takes many hours, six to eight hours for this to, to do its thing. And you um, inject your dialysate, which is dialysate tends to be fairly hypertonic fluid, and you inject that into your abdomen, you fill your abdominal cavity up with this dialysate, 
And then what happens is urea, electrolytes, right, amino acids, whatever, gets pulled into the abdominal cavity, right, across the peritoneal membrane. And then you drain all of that off, right? That's called peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis is a little different in that you have to access the circulation generally through a fistula or a shunt. If you're talking emergent dialysis, you have to you generally access that through um, a central line. We'll put a large, um, in, and this is something that a, a physician or a mid-level provider has to put in. Um, but what you do is you will pull blood out of your patient, right? And then that blood will go into the dialysis machine. And basically the blood will go through an area where you have a membrane. So you have blood traveling on one side of the membrane. And then on the other side of the membrane, you have dialysate fluid passing through. And then stuff diffuses from the blood into the dialysate. And that's how you can get rid of things like potassium and urea and all that. Does that, does that kind of make sense? That's the concept behind hemodialysis. You guys cool with that? Speaking of that, what's an huh? average like fluid loss during dialysis? Like, it varies quite a bit. You can even gain fluid sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you can know, gain like, and lose. Yeah. Like, I've heard some like, just absolutely crazy numbers. Sometimes liters. Place, like four liters, five liters. Liters, yeah. Fluid come off somehow. Liters. And that it leads to a great... Um, a great thing that I want to emphasize, when you guys are assessing your renal patients, you need to ask them about their weight, and you need to ask about weight loss and weight gain. Okay, so if you have a renal patient and they tell you, oh, I'm having difficulty breathing, I just don't feel good, and I've gained 10 pounds over the past 12 hours, what does that tell you? Oh my, do we have some fluid building up in here, right? Or let's say somebody got di so let's say you get called the dialysis center and you have a patient who, who has a, a acute alteration in their mental status, their blood pressure is really abnormal, and the dialysis nurse says, oh yeah, um, the, the patient lost 10 pounds um, following di dialysis. What does that tell you? Oh my, have we lost some fluid and electrolytes, right? And in fact, there is a syndrome known as disequilibrium syndrome that can occur in dialysis patients, particularly if they get dialyzed very aggressively and you have large um, electrolyte shifts and fluid shifts, right? They can develop this disequilibrium syndrome where their blood pressure becomes kind of kind of uh, weird and unstable and they have neurological changes, um, they can have electrolyte an anomalies and abnormalities. Is there much we can do about it? Not really, other than supportive care. Um, maybe give, you know, if, 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 if they look like they need it, we can give small fluid boluses. Um, if their potassium is really high and we're, we're concerned about life-threatening hyperkalemia, we can treat that accordingly. Right. But um, weight is going to be a very important part of the history for a renal patient. What's their weight doing? Um, and something known as an I and O. Are you guys familiar with I and O? Intake and output, right? Yeah. Can we account for what's going in and what's coming out? Okay, that's an important part. In fact, that's important for all hospitalized patients in general. You guys, you guys cool with that? Sort of makes sense, kind of? Excellent. All right. Um, Is there one dialysis that's, I guess, harder Maybe on the body or on the patient? Um, no, they're both pretty rough. You know, hemodialysis, you know, you have to deal with shunts and fistulas, and they don't last forever, and you've got bleeding. And um, But peritoneal dialysis, you've got infection risk is, is going to be a lot higher. Um, and it can be very painful. You get lots of cramping in that. So there really isn't. Um, dialysis in general is, you know, there are a lot of, yeah, a lot of risks associated with it. Both, both can be really tough. Hemodialysis is generally, if you have a sick patient, they need hemodialysis. Peritoneal dialysis is not really going to help an acutely ill, you know, someone who's in acute renal failure. Yeah. 
Um, in the hospital, occasionally dialysis is known as renal replacement therapy. Okay, so don't don't be you know too surprised if you hear that term renal re replacement therapy. Um, dialysis is sometimes done for reasons other than renal failure. And what are some other major reasons dialysis might be done? Huh? Overdose, Overdose is going to be your primary, yeah. Overdose electrolyte and abnormalities, yeah. Right. Uh, particularly polar drugs. Somebody's overdosed on a polar drug. Dialysis tends to be effective. So um, anything that's acidic, like um, aspirin, salicylates, uh, lithium, um, some of those things can can be dialyzed reasonably well. Nonpolar drugs or fatty drugs, dialysis is not particularly effective. As if somebody's overdosed on, say, um, I don't know, like morphine or something, um, yeah, dialysis is not going to do a whole lot there because <laughs> that morphine has been sequestered into uh, um, compartments of your body that that are not accessed by, by dialysis, if that, that makes sense. You guys you guys okay there with that? Kind of makes sense? Okie dokie. Um, let's stop it.